is ongoing introduction to Byzantine Christianity and uh, this is number eight in our series. I don't think we've missed any months. We began in January, so now it's August. The time flies very quickly. So we've had a progression of, of um, lectures, catechetical lectures on um, the unique nature, the origins and nature. I hear noises here. Voices to say, Michael, I'm going to close the door if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, on the unique nature, origins, and nature. Oh, <laughs> there, sure, of course. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I went to the competition church down the street by mistake. Which one? Which one? The Orthodox Cathedral? No, no, no. The, the star of the, the sea. The one. The, the papers one. one. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh St. Monica's. Yes. Uh, Take a lump salt will take. Yeah. <laughs> You're forgiven for that. <laughs> the papers one. Yeah. Okay. So, introduction to Byzantine Christianity, uh, number eight in the series. And what we're looking at is e exactly that question. What is distinctive about um, Eastern Christianity, and specifically Byzantine Christianity, which most people associate, of course, with Orthodoxy? And what is Orthodoxy in full communion with Rome, the Apostolic See? which would be Byzantine Catholicism, per se. What are the unique origins? What is the unique nature of that type of, that, that expression of Christianity? It's a particular church. And a particular church, according to the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II, is a unique embodiment of the entirety of the mystery of Christ. How does a particular church in its historic origins, in its people, in its ethical, uh, uh, ethnic cultural makeup, receive and appropriate to itself the mystery of Christ? How does it understand that mystery? How does it understand the gospel? How does it live? How does it celebrate the mystery of Christ in the Eucharist and in the sacraments? How does it um, articulate and share that celebration, that internal celebration with others, so that it's not an in-house event, as it were? You know, this, is, this is our neighborhood, you know, our little ethnic neighborhood. How does it go beyond that tendency, that temptation, and share with others the riches, the treasure that it has received? What is distinctive about the Byzantine neighborhood, so to speak, that has something to say to the larger neighborhood of the world of today? That's the question. Because being in communion with Rome means being Catholic, and Catholic means being universal. So what is the distinctiveness of the Byzantine, and especially in this parish, Russian Byzantine tradition, that has something to say to universal Christianity that isn't necessarily always being emphasized in Western culture of today? What, what is it that we have to share uh, with others? What is it that we can learn from Byzantine Christianity? The mystical element. Right. And you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that, thank you, Mary, I'm going to put that into two words. That young people of today would be able to relate to. That anybody without a theological background would be able to connect with. Because a lot of people say mystical, you know, they, they, people have all kinds of, you know, interpretations of that, and they might have interpretations of the two words that I'm going to reduce that to, but let's start with those. You're right on. But let's, let's translate that into what, what it means to be a mystic. Let's say that Byzantine Christianity is, and is all about, a love, love story. A love story. Meaning you don't have to say you're sorry? 
No. <laughs> That's a fake love story that the culture of those of, from which that emerged right. that, that is um, that is counterfeit. You know what I mean? And so orthodoxy means correct worship, which is an expression of correct belief. What is the, what is the authentic love story? as distinct from the counterfeit love story of the world celebrating itself. What is the correct, hi, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> Great. What is the correct love story that expresses God's relationship with his people? So right from the get-go, Byzantine Christianity wanted to go back to the original experience of the apostles of the twelve and of the disciples with the Lord and recapture and seek to more fully and richly and deeply understand articulate and share with others the experience of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember what they said after that or during that experience afterwards reflecting upon it? Were not our hearts burning within us. Right there you have the essence of orthodoxy. Right there you have the essence of classical Christianity. By orthodoxy, by the way, I'm not talking about a denomination, religious denomination. I'm talking about the early understanding of that word as correct belief, correct worship of God going back to you know, the earliest centuries of the church. The Orthodox were those who accepted the early ecumenical councils, especially the Council of Chalcedon, Ephesus and Chalcedon, Constantinople, that sought to answer that question. Why were our hearts burning? Who would cause your hearts to burn? The Lord, you know? I mean, people can have counterfeit relationships that last, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, but what is it that changes your life until death and beyond death forever? That's the question. It's the question that the Lord put to Peter. Well, Peter answered it. He put it to the disciples. Who do you say that I am? So Byzantine Christianity goes back to that original experience of the disciples at Emmaus and seeks to understand through reflection, a reflective understanding of that experience. And from that reflective understanding of that experience arrive at an insight which is more than merely a human guess or conjecture, conjecture or you know, surmising or 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 or, or whatever. It, it, it's, 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 it's an insight that's inspired by the Spirit. Okay, Byzantine Christianity uses the word synergy. Synergy is that energy within us that coalesces with the energy of the Spirit of God and becomes one. <coughs> So there's a synergy that is this very insight. We, we look back on the original experience, we reflect upon that, and the reflective understanding of the experience leads to an insight that helps us to, to, to get back to the experience itself, and then to articulate, okay, And by articulate, I mean either, you know, talk about or write about the original experience and then to share that same experience with others. 
The sharing is through storytelling, love story, you're telling the story, and you're making that story a reality through worship. A worship in which the original experience is recapitulated, in which that experience is made present. Not as something that we create ourselves, not self-manufactured, but as a given, as a gift from God, part of the original experience. So worship, Byzantine worship, is not something we've fabricated, not something we've created in the Petri dish of you know, the little liturgists get together and they say, oh, how can we do this? How can we add this? How can we take this away? We, we receive that original experience of the hearts burning on the road to Emmaus. How did they recognize him, that he was the Lord, the same Lord? Through the breaking of bread, which is the Eucharist. Okay. So Byzantine Christianity has sought to retain, so there's something conservative about Byzantine Christianity. You know, we, when we hear the word conservative, some Americans politicize that word. It means you're a member of a particular political party, Republican or whatever. And, the, and, and some people who who are a member of another political party say, oh, how boring, how out of date, oh, that's so Eisenhower, that's so my grandparents, whatever. Conservative in the religious tradition of Byzantine Christianity has none of those con connotations. Conservative, like the word tradition, in Byzantine Christianity is something living, active, and dynamic. It means that you are actualizing, that you are making ever new and present this original experience that made the hearts of the disciples burn with love on the road to Emmaus as they encountered Jesus Christ, the Lord, the God, and the Savior of all. Who would not want to hang on to that? That's what the word conserve means. Preserve, conserve that experience. Conservationist, not as a memory of something past, but as something that's preserved and handed on as living for those to come. And so orthodoxy is simply the matter of correct or right hanging on to, conserving and handing on this original experience which is what? A love story. A love story between God and his people. But I thought God was all the things I talked about that I sang, chanted in the anaphora today, the Eucharistic prayer. Ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible. How do you have a love story? How do you have an encounter? How do you have an experience as a human being with that which is all of those things? Ineffable, inconceivable, incomprehensible, and invisible. God himself has to initiate that. God himself, who is all of those things, must break through, as it were, the invisibility, the incomprehensibility, the ineffability of God's self in order to connect with those whom he has created out of love, because he is love itself. And that very love brings forth what we call the incarnation. He who is the only begotten Son, the immortal Word, the image of the Father, who for our sake, out of love for us, who love us mankind, became one with, one of his own creation, became man and fleshed, human. And so Byzantine Christianity recognizes that this experience is not just any other ordinary experience, the experience of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, but is the experience of one who is 
the initiator of this love story between God and his creation. God, the creator of all, who becomes one with one of his own creation. Well, right away that rings alarm bells. How could that be? How can God become one of his own creation without ceasing to be God? And so the early councils, ecumenical councils of the church are a part of the heritage of universal Christianity, both East and West, as the church sought to, under the inspiration, insight of the Holy Spirit, understand and articulate how that could be. Understand and articulate and share with others the original response of Peter on behalf of the Twelve as he answered the question of the Lord, Who do you say that I am? You are the Christos, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. So Nicaea and Ephesus and Chalcedon and Constantinople, all of the seven ecumenical count Nicaea too, all of the early ecumenical councils of the universal church of the first millennium recognized by both East and West sought to enter into this process experience, reflective understanding, insight, articulate, which again means both, you know, thinking, writing, talking, to share with others this, 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 this whole journey of getting back to and more fully experiencing that original initial experience of the love story, hearts burning with love for the God who is in our midst in Christ Jesus the Lord. <coughs> So aside from all the, the, all the heavy-duty, you know, academic stuff that you would read. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Thank you, Thank Thank you for being here. Welcome. Welcome. Aside from all that, you know, if you, if you read a book, you know, Introduction to Byzantine Christianity, you know, in the bookstore or something, you might, oh my goodness, that's not for me. <laughs> you know, guess what? It is for you. It's for everybody. It's all about this, the love story that describes the inner desire of the human heart, the collective human heart. Every human heart is yearning for God. Why? Because God planted that desire in us. It's our spiritual DNA to search for, to yearn for, to long for God and a communion, a full union of love with God outside of which there's never full or complete happiness. Byzantine Christianity sought to articulate, to understand and share with others how that desire could be fulfilled. How it is that God could be both God and human at the same time. And how it is that given humanity's propensity to self-destruct, in the search for God to fall short of that challenge towards loving God that God could repair that within humanity that God could restore the original plan or will of God that there would be a synergy a synergy, a union of wills between God and humanity Okay. So the early ecumenical councils, can I erase this? You got it. Okay. So experience, understanding, insight, articulate, share, and then that brings us back to, the sh in the sharing, and sharing is action, okay? So the, 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 the full reality of the Christian experience is to go from experience to understanding the deeper, richer insight into what you've understood of that experience and then articulating or sharing that with others. And so that's an, that's an action that changes your life and can change the lives of others that, 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 that completes the circle and leads you back to the original experience itself at a richer, fuller, deeper level or layer. Okay. 
So the story of Byzantine Christianity is the story of the first millennium of the history of Christianity where in the Byzantine East, which were where things were happening in Christianity, um, all of that was happening through what we call the councils, the ecumenical <coughs> councils of the church, which sought to articulate and define the answer of Peter to the question of the Lord, who do you say that I am? And in those councils, which we've all inherited, then we have an understanding of God as creator, but who becomes one with, one of, one of his own creation. And the early ecumenical councils, which we've described in the earlier um, lectures, talks about the gift of the Father, the gift of the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, which is the gift of his own son. And that son, the only begotten son, the immortal word, which in Greek is logos, the logos of the son, the understanding, the wisdom of the father, the pattern upon which all things was created, becomes enfleshed, becomes one with his own creation. And that this takes place by the power of the breath, in Latin now, back to Latin, spiritus, the breath of or spirit of the Father. So that the mystery that we define as incarnation is a dual gift of the Father. The gift of the word or logos of the Father and the gift of the breath, the very love of the Father, the spirit of the Father, which makes possible the enfleshment of the Logos. Because the Logos is the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Who did The Lord said that to Philip. Philip, the Father and I are one. So there's a relationship there which is a oneness. And that oneness is love the divine love itself, which is the spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the paraclete. And so that spirit rests upon the heart of the Logos. It's the very love of the Father, which the Logos, the Son, has received, not created, but begotten, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. We, we hear that from the very first ecumenical council held in the East, Nicaea, that describes who this person is, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son, the immortal Word of the Father. And the spirit of divine love, the spirit of the Father, rests upon the Logos, reposes upon Him eternally. And that spirit is such that it brings the Logos to creation. The Logos is the one in whom, through whom, through whom, all things were created, and yet who becomes one of his own creation by how? The power of that very spirit of, of, of God. The love by which God created all things, created all things so that all things might become one with God, return to God. But the vehicle, the means by which that is going to happen is that God must become part of his own creation in order to vehicle, to make possible that, 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 that connection, that communion. So the incarnation isn't an afterthought. It's not plan B, you know, in God's creative design, in God's original creative plan or will. It's the, it's the original will of God. St. Paul said that. All was created through him. All was created for him. He is before all else that is. Who is he talking about? The Logos. But not just the second person of the Trinity, but Christ. The Logos enfleshed. The Logos, the word of the Father, made man. Why would he have to be enfleshed? What is, what is that plan of God that would join together God and creation? How could that be possible? 
remember that old that old series in the 60s mission impossible this is mission impossible folks why is it mission impossible what are we trying to join together the uncreated <clears throat> and the creative the divine and the human flesh and spirit Oops, <laughs> thank you I'm losing my mind here senior moment spirit and flesh so what is everything on this category created and therefore limited temporal restricted by time and space mortal what's over here all those things we talked about earlier ineffable inconceivable can't be bounded by time or space incomprehensible invisible etc infinitely transcendent infinitely transcendent unable to be contained God in God's essence is beyond comprehension beyond being captured and contained so somehow in order for God's creation to to attain to this realm of the divine and partake in participate in the very life of the divine and attain to achieve a full union a transforming union of love with the divine the divine has to take the initiative as I said earlier and must itself make possible, mission impossible, by becoming one with his own creation. So the incarnation is the whole plan of creation. God creates in order to become one with his own creation because it is by no other means that that creation can attain to union, to likeness, to participation in the life of God himself. So Byzantine Christianity's contribution to the story, the love story, is exactly that fact. God created you in order for you to be united to him. And in order to make that possible, he became part of you in the most intimate way possible. He, ineffable, inconceivable, invisible by nature, became enfleshed and constricted himself within the bounds of time and space, sharing with you a human life, a human journey, human experiences, joys and sorrows, even pain and suffering and death itself. And that's what we call the gospel, which is translated as good news. And so the answer to the yearnings, the deepest yearnings and struggles and, 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 and hopes and aspirations of, of humanity is found in this mystery of incarnation. Christ is the answer to every human question about itself, its nature, its origin, and its destiny. And by the power of the Spirit becomes more than simply a cerebral, intellectual answer to a question, but becomes that experience, that encounter that the disciples had on the road to Emmaus. What did they say? Wasn't that a marvelous theological treatise that we just read that helped us understand it all? Wasn't that a marvelous rule of conduct for ethical behavior that we learned? A manual that will keep us decent and law-abiding people. No. They said, we're not our hearts burning within us. Something touched the inner core, the depths of every yearning and aspiration that the human person could have. Who could do that except Christ, who is God in our midst? Emmanuel instead of Emmanuel. Yes. 
Emmanuel instead of a manual. And so Christianity has the perennial temptation of turning it into a manual. You know? And so if you understand and keep the rules, you're a good Christian. But the Christian is called to be a mystic because a mystic is the lover of God. And, and this is a love story. And so the incarnation, which, which is what Byzantine, the first thousand years of Byzantine Christianity, was the attempt to articulate the understanding of the incarnation through its councils, through its liturgy, its theology, its spirituality. It's all about that love story, understanding it, sharing it, and bringing it to completion through that process. Otherwise, it does become simply a history of dogma, which Byzantine Christianity for most people appears to be the case, and a history of the manuals, the, you know, the, 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 the ritual, the history, etc. And unless you're really just into ritual for the sake of ritual, the smells and the bells and the doctrine for the sake of the intellectual cerebral story of it all, which is interesting in and of itself, it's, it's, it's the virgin version of the theological mechanic, you know, the person who's really great at figuring out cars, how cars run. They're theologians like that. They're really interested in how a particular religious tradition uh, understands itself and its history, you know. But that, will, that won't save your soul. It won't quench your thirst for God's love. <laughs> it's not the love story I'm talking about. See? So professional religiosity is not what this is all about. It moves beyond just that. It includes those gifts and those interests, but, but, but that's where the original experience has to be what we're trying to understand. Not just understanding for the sake of understanding where we become professional theologians just for the sake of your, you know, your hobby happens to be religion, Byzantine Christianity. It's a love story. Yes. Is it fair to say that this um, Byzantine tradition uh, correlates with the Latin religious community, such as the Carmelites, such as Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, the infused contempla contemplation, the love that John, you know, you will be judged not by your theology or by your love, you know, how you love. Where did the Carmelites come from? <laughs> <laughs> Mount Carmel. Where is that? Haifa near Israel. They were the granted they, they were Latin ex crusaders, pilgrims from the fourth Latin Crusade, but they settled on the holy mountain. Who were they inspired by? Ancient Israel. The whole of the Eastern Judeo, Judeo and later Christian tradition of the prophets, the heroes, the the, the, the solitaries who were passionately, madly in love with God. I am ze zealous for the zeal, you know, the house of God, you know, the prophet Elisha. And so that's the original spirit that Teresa wanted to return to in the reform of Carmel. And so it's, it's the same tradition. It's the return to the sources, the living tradition. And any reform in Western Christianity has had some kind of yearning or nostalgia for this original experience. The early fathers of the church, fa Latin fathers and doctors of the church, were completely connected with this original story of Latin Christianity. Pope, Pope, Pope Leo, you know, in, in the early uh, council, Chalcedon, what did they say? Peter has spoken through the mouth of Leo because he came and he resonated with this tradition um, at an early ecumenical council held in the East because he answered once again the answer of Peter to the question of the Lord, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so in this early tradition, we do not yet have the denominational differences that followed later in later centuries with their nationalistic polemics and divisions. We have a united Christian faith of the first millennium, East and West, together. The difference is that in the Latin West, the genius of, of Rome was organizational, legal, political for organizing and administrating a, a, a great empire. The, or, the, the genius of the Byzantine East was different. It was distinct. Okay, you guys can organize everything. You can tell us how to do it, but we're going to tell you why. 
we're going to do it. The poetic, the philosophical, the artistic, the intellectual, all of those things that are the why of, of the what. You know what I mean? And, and that keeps, keeps the heart of it all there. And so Rome sent legates, the Bishop of Rome would send legates to these early ecumenical councils, but they weren't held in the, in the West because those questions, the answer to the, 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 the seeking of the understanding of the original experience, wasn't, wasn't, those questions weren't being asked in the West, they were being asked in the East. In the East, everybody, hi, how are you? In the East, everybody was a theologian. You know, we don't recognize that fact, but in the East, um, you know, it'd be like going over to the Chevron across the street here, and you're pumping gas, and the guy comes up to you and says, what do you think about Nestorius and that heresy? And that, oh, well, blah, 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 you know. Every, uh, the people at the market were theologians, you know. They were vitally interested in all of these questions. In the West, you know, you would be talking to a soldier and he would say, are you a Roman citizen or I'm going to cut your throat? <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a different reality, you know. There, it, wasn't, it, was, it was a different culture. So this cultural, intellectual, philosophical seeking to understand the original experience of the disciples to articulate and share it with others took place within a tradition in Byzantine Christianity that borrowed from the ancient heritage of this poetic, cultural, philosophical, artistic uh, her heritage that was guided especially by, by the great philosophers, Hellenistic philosophy. So Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, etc. So the early ecumenical councils used purified, purified in light of the Christian tradition, but, but expressed through or by means of Hellenistic philosophy, the early articulation of the church with regard to who do you say that I am, the, 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 the mystery of Christ. How can someone be both divine and human at the same time? And remember last time we, we, we talked about that in terms of a utilization of Hellenistic philosophy, which is the notion of person, which in Greek is hypostasis. You are a hypostasis. You have. You are a person. You're composed of body, soul, intellect, memory, will, spirit, and subdivisions of those would include your emotions, your feelings, your hopes, aspirations, gifts, personality type, etc. Education, environment, how you've been conditioned, etc. That's you. When did you as a hypostasis begin to be? Conception. Conception. Did you exist? Yes, you existed in the mind of God, but before the moment of your conception, did you as hypostasis, all those things I just mentioned, be, uh, exist? No. As a human, as a human person, you began to exist as hypostasis at conception. Does Christ have a hypostasis? Yeah. And when did he begin to exist? At the Annunciation, which is the conception of the Lord. Oh, forever. <laughs> 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 